If you want to know everything about hip health, then this is the video for you. I recently linked up with ACE physiotherapist Will Harlow, who's in Farnham in Surrey. Will's a specialist in keeping the over 50s fit, flexible and active. His YouTube channel is amazing. I'll put a link to it in the description below. I saw some of his videos recently and was inspired to get in touch with him, as we have so much in common when it comes to helping people with hip problems. In this video, we talk about everything about hips, from what to do before surgery, different types of hip replacements, supplements, and how to stay strong, fit, and healthy for longer. Let's get into it. Um, so my name's Will Harlow, and um, I'm a physiotherapist from um, Farnham in Surrey, uh, which is just um, uh, southwest of London. And I've got a private practice here called HT Physio, and we specialize in helping people who are over 50, um, to improve their mobility, to improve their independence and um, to live a life without pain pills. Um, as such, I see a lot of patients similar to yours. I, I see people pre and post hip surgery. So I think this is going to be a, a really in, informative discussion. And um, yeah. as you mentioned, I've got a, a YouTube channel, which is probably how most people know me by. And um, on my channel, my, my job really is to try and share uh, open access information for people who want to improve their health and I share exercises and tips to help them do just that. Fantastic. Well, there's a huge amount of interest in people, you know, like me, middle-aged people wanting to maintain their health, strength and fitness um, for as long as possible and avoiding, of course, the problems of frailty. I see a lot of patients who have had you know, a lot of pain and stiffness from their hips, poor mobility for two or three years before they get to surgery. And of course, their condition's not great when they come to surgery. So, I'm very interested in trying to optimize my patient's condition so that they have a better potential for rehabilitation. They can get better quickly and, of course, make the most of their pain-free hip to regain the fitness and strength that they had before their hips start to become a problem. Yeah, absolutely agree. I mean, frailty is a big problem. As I see it, frailty is a combination of uh, poor muscle mass and strength. Um, and probably poor mobility, both around a joint and in just the general way that you move. And combined, that can be a really deadly combination. And we have a, a saying here in the practice for our patients who are considering going in for surgery, and that is that the better you go in, the better you come out. Uh, I'm sure that's um, something you see as well with your patients. Definitely completely agree with that. I and mean, we see a lot of you know, uh, comorbidities pe of people coming into surgery who are suffering from conditions like type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, the usual conditions of middle age, which of course have a big impact on surgery and, and the, the risks of surgery, the risks to life and limb. So anything we can do to improve people's prospects is, uh, is, is hugely positive. Uh, from my point of view, I'm sure yours. So how many people do you yeah. see who have arthritic hips, particularly, Will, in your practice? What... Oh, I'll see a minimum one a day when I'm treating. Um, and my, my other physios will see possibly one person every single day, at least uh, out of, I don't know, we see sort of 12 people a day on average. So um, it, it's super common. Uh, we've We've got at least 50 or so people on our books as a total who will have arthritic hips. Um, some of those I would I would count as, um, you know, arthritic hip patients have gone on to have total hip replacements. And then, I mean, after the surgery, you're dealing with um, hopefully a better situation, but there are still issues that need sorting out. Um, obviously, after surgery, there's a long period of um, reduced activity. So inevitably, you're going to lose some strength and mobility. So we help people to regain that um, as well. How, what can I do to sort of help give you some information about hip surgery, which might be useful for your patients? Yeah, I think this is going to be really, really useful because um, part of my job is fielding the questions that possibly the patient didn't get chance to ask the surgeon. And especially if they're going through the NHS, the appointments can be super fast. It's like in and out, do you want to have it? Yes or no. And then it's like, right, here's your date. So I think one of the biggest um, questions that someone might have if, if they've got hip arthritis and they're considering surgery is what are the signs that you would look for that might suggest someone would be an excellent candidate for surgery? Okay, well, the, the commonest sort of symptoms that people present to me with are a pain in the upper thigh. So that's the commoner symptom. And often they'll localize that to the groin uh, and, the, and then pain in the buttocks, very common. 
and the pain radiates down the front of the thigh, usually to the knee, but sometimes beyond as well. So it's, it can be quite easy to confuse um, hip pain with stuff like sciatica or knee arthritis as well. But often a, a, a physical examination where isolating the hip joint will be diagnostic. So bending the knee to 90 degrees and then rotating the hip. If it's stiff and painful, particularly in an Internal, internal rotation of the hip that's usually diagnostic of a stiff arthritic hip in terms of um arthritis I, i'm writing a chapter in my new book at the moment about um arthritis as a as a condition and what the evidence says about treating it how much do you think jeremy of arthritis is down to just bad luck and genetics and how much of it do you think is down to how someone has lived their lived their life and their lifestyle mm. Well, it's, it's a really good question. I mean, there's undoubtedly a, a strong genetic component to osteoarthritis. Um, it definitely runs in families. Uh, and if you've got a close relative, you know, parent or sibling who has got osteoarthritis of one or more joints, the likelihood is that you're going to get it as well. Um, I think it's difficult to quantify, but certainly if you can find signs, physical signs of people who are likely to get multiple joint osteoarthritis, particularly with nodes in the hand, uh, in the mm. small joints of the finger, Heberden's nodes are often a, an indicator of an underlying genetic predisposition. And then you have to take into account people's occupation. So somebody might have a genetic predisposition to osteoarthritis, but if they don't do anything to sort of promote that arthritis from developing in, in their earlier life, it might not present till later on. But someone who has a genetic predisposition who maybe plays contact sports, heavy manual labor, will certainly get symptoms and signs of arthritis in their middle age. And of course, the other big genetic factor, particularly in women, is, is the development of dysplasia of the hip joint. That certainly runs in families. I often see mothers and their middle-aged daughters who have dysplastic hips. And often their radiological signs, they go for an X-ray and it might show mild dysplasia, but they don't have a lot of arthritis on the X-ray, but they do have a degenerative joint. And often you have to probe around a little bit further to get the diagnosis, including doing an MRI scan or CT scan uh, to try and confirm that diagnosis. From my point of view, I. I mean, it's, as you say, it's really difficult to quantify. I would like to say it's something like 50-50 genetics lifestyle. I think we've got a huge um, uh, influence over when it develops or if it develops. And um, your 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 general health and your health around that specific joint, I think, play a, a major, major role. And yeah. we know that with recent research coming out now says that you know, the strength around your joint is actually a better determinant of whether or not you're going to feel symptoms in that joint than the actual radiographic changes seen on the x-ray. That's definitely the case with the knees. And I would imagine it's possibly the case with hips as well. Um, so I think if someone's got arthritis on x-ray, what I like to say to them is that doesn't necessarily mean anything in and of itself. We need to look at your symptoms. We need to look at how those symptoms develop and what's going on mechanically around the joint. Like, are your muscles working well? Can your joint move? Because sometimes people will come to me with a stiff hip, which has some confirmed mild to moderate arthritis. And with some great exercises and some consistency, that movement can really improve. It might not go back to 100%, but they can get it to a point where you know, they can get in and out of a car or in and out of the bath without pain anymore. Yeah. So I think everyone's individual, um, but the, the the functional mechanical stuff makes a massive, massive difference. I, I, I definitely. And the evidence definitely supports that. Well, there's a big study in Bournemouth University um, looking at cycling uh, in the management of osteoarthritis of the lower limb and some big improvements uh, on a cycling program for middle aged people with early osteoarthritis and certainly delaying surgery in that cohort of patients can be done with a regular program of exercise uh, so it has huge benefits and i'm sure it's it's not just um, the joint that's affected by the exercise but as you say the surrounding muscles stabilizing those muscles making the yeah. capsule and the, the ligaments more flexible i think has a big effect because it's not just the joint surface it's all of those tissues around the joint and how that joint functions that determines people's symptoms and how what their functional impairment is as well. 
when we when we exercise to improve the function in a joint, we're we're improving that joint, but we're also improving the whole body. And um, I think that's just as valuable. And I'm sure in in the study with the I haven't seen the the Bournemouth study, but I'd love to read it. But I'm sure one of the things they saw is if if their patient spent long enough doing the cycling trial, one of the other benefits they might see is some weight loss. And we know from the evidence that keeping yourself within healthy bounds of of BMI um, is is a great way to reduce arthritic pain through the load bearing joints, um, hips, knees, and the spine makes a massive difference. Even a small amount of weight loss we find can, can really translate to, to a lot less pain for, for many people. Definitely. I mean, the biomechanics, the hip are extraordinary. If you look at the way the lever arms work, you know, every time we walk, we're putting three or four times body weight through the hip joint. So there are big gains to be had, even with small amounts of, of, of weight loss. And one of the things that, yeah. that's me, uh, I've started using a body composition scales in my clinic to look at people's uh, bone mass, uh, their visceral fat, which is a very interesting measurement, and all co- and their biological age as well, because I think that's becoming increasingly important now. It's not just looking at people's chronological age, but what's your metabolic age? How healthy are you, uh, despite you know your chronological age? Because I see a lot of patients who who are, are sort of prematurely aged by the fact that they're out of condition, and conversely, people who exercise who eat well you keep their weight under control their biological age is a lot younger than their chronological age and that has an influence mm. on how we might select uh, the appropriate operation for them how would it so to go to specifics how would that make a difference to what you might do uh, in your surgery well there's um i mean i'd be i'd use a technique um called hip resurfacing which has been around for a long time now it's in its third yeah. decade I trained under the guy who invented it, um, which conserves the bone of the of, of the hip. So I'll show you a, 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 a an image of that. So here's um, an, a radiograph of some of a patient who's had both a hip resurfacing, which is this device here, this implant here on yep. the hip, and there's a hip replacement. So hip mm. replacement brought about to try and improve the longevity of a hip. Uh, particularly in younger people and, and men of working age who are particularly hard on hip replacements, where the rate yeah. of failure due to wear is higher. So anything you can do to conserve their bone and give them a durable bearing um, might have benefits because they, they can avoid or delay the need for having redo or revision surgery later on. And so re- resurfacing has been a, a big part of contemporary hip replacement surgery so you can see the difference here this is a hip replacement where the head of the femur has been removed and a stem mm. goes the femur whereas a hip resurfacing you're covering the head and i'll show you some um some implants and you can see the the difference between the two types of hip so here's a hip replacement which is made of titanium socket we put yeah. a, a plastic liner done a head which is made of ceramic So that's a hip replacement, total hip replacement, very commonly used type of hip replacement. Yeah. Titanium, ceramic, and plastic. And here's a hip resurfacing. This is the Birmingham hip, the original metal on metal hip resurfacing. So that's like, yeah. So that's made of chrome cobalt alloy, a super alloy. And that's been very good, particularly for men. It hasn't worked so well for women um, because women tend to react to some of the metals in these devices and that can cause quite a nasty reaction. So it's, it's put a lot of people off using hip resurfacing, but mm. I think later this year, this is a ceramic resurfacing. Uh, oh yeah. Which is uh, an, an amazing device. It's made of the same ceramic as you use in the hip replacement, but in the form of a hip resurfacing. So we're hoping that this will have the advantages of that metal hip resurfacing, but yeah available now to be used uh, particularly in in middle-aged women so we've got that's fantastic i I didn't realize that about the the reactions that were happening with with women what do they think is going on there is that something to do with uh, postmenopausal changes in hormones well it's a very interesting question Uh, multifactorial women tend to be a bit more allergic to um to base metals like nickel Uh, it's a very Mm -hmm. common allergy nickel and uh, one of the theories is that women get exposed to nickel in jewelry when they you know when they start wearing jewelry in their teens 
a uh, lot yeah. of um, inexpensive jewellery contains base metals like chromium and nickel particularly, and that might sensitise them so that when they come to having knee or hip replacement surgery in their 40s or 50s, that might that sensitive that sensitization they had in their teens might then express itself as a, a quite a florid reaction around that implant so we saw Gosh. some bad reactions to some metal hip replacements many of which were withdrawn about 10 years ago um and i always ask I, anybody's undergoing hip surgery i always ask do they have any reactions to metals back of a wristwatch earrings particularly and in those people i won't use alloys which contain nickel which is a su surprisingly ubiquitous material. But that's why this ceramic, uh, the ceramic resurfacing, or is it the tip replacement, the ceramic resurfacing, yeah. might, it will get rid of the alloys, which um, particularly nickel, uh, which can cause reactions. That's fascinating. I have heard about the ceramic hip replacements being um, incredibly successful. Yeah. It seems like titanium is the, the go-to, especially in the NHS, but... I'm not sure what the benefits or drawbacks would be of um, of of moving everyone over to ceramic. Well, the expense is the problem. And the majority of people, right. 70s or 80s, don't need high-tech implants um, because yeah. if you look at the outcome from a straightforward, what we call a hybrid hip replacement, where the stem is put in with bone cement and the socket is uncemented, uh, mm. that combination of hip replacements is, is good value there's lots of them different types of well, brands of those around but they're very good value and for somebody who's in their 70s or 80s there's probably an 80 to 90 percent chance that will last at least 20 years yeah i mean I, i've seen quite a lot of changes just in the last 10 years where i've been practicing i think both in um how long someone can expect their hip replacement to last but also in how well they do so quickly you know post-op yeah. it seems like the um the recovery process gets easier and easier for for people as the technology improves. I don't know if you've seen something similar in your practice. Absolutely. I mean, uh, when I first started, you know, people would stay in 10 days after a hip replacement. And, you know, the people who trained me, my bosses back in the old days, people would stay in for three or four weeks after a hip replacement. It just seems extraordinary. Wow. Now we get them up on the day of surgery, a very, very focused, streamlined rehab pathways. So we're hoping to get people home the next day or day two. Yeah. Sometimes they need to stay a bit longer. But in the US, there's a big push now to do ambulatory surgery. So you go into what's called an ambulatory mm. surgery center. You yeah. get first thing in the morning. They get you up as soon as you've had your operation, as soon as the anesthesia is worn off. And you go home or to a hotel that same day. So we've spoken just a little bit there, Jeremy, about you know the first couple of days after discharge. Kind of medium to long term, what can someone expect after a hip replacement if they choose to have one okay so in terms of recovery i sort of break it down into units of six weeks and three months so the first six weeks is is quite hard going for a lot of people um usually on crutches for about a month or so around the house dispensing with crutches after about three or four weeks i let my patients drive at a month if they feel confident uh, by about six weeks most people are independently mobile indoors and outdoors and then the second six weeks is really consolidating on the first phase of rehab, walking further, doing more repetitions of their exercises, sleeping more soundly, not taking painkillers anymore. So by about three months, the majority of people have mostly forgotten that they've had surgery. Occasionally, the hip will twinge a little bit. But generally, they're back to work, starting to think about playing sports, you know, golf, tennis, getting back into those sorts of sports again but a year to 18 months generally to get to the end point of their recovery because it's a it's a big sort of complex mix of physiological and psychological factors going into surgery is stressful particularly if you're working or you're looking after somebody you've got a lot of stress on board which inevitably expresses itself during your rehabilitation and i think what people underestimate about surgery is how tired they are they get completely yeah. wiped out so i really emphasize to people that you must rest if you feel tired you go and lie down don't fight it lie down for at least an hour twice a day don't sit in a chair for more than half an hour gently move as soon as you feel tired just surrender to it and go and lie down 
I, I completely agree. I like to say to my patients that your body doesn't know the difference between what you've had done and a significant traumatic injury. You know, it's, it's a huge insult on the body. It's, it's one of the biggest joints in the body has been taken out. They've, they've had something new put in there. The body's got to get used to it. It's got to heal. And just because we see people, you know, doing really well, kind of three months after their, their surgery, people can look at that and think, well, it must be easy sailing because the recovery is quite fast. Yeah, but it is a major incident, and you've you've got to you've got to allow your body that recovery, or that chance to recover and heal. Um, to build on what you were saying with the recovery process, I like how you chunk it into six week blocks, and that's what we tend to do as well. And I think that that first six weeks is all about kind of getting them moving really gently again, reducing the swelling and the pain getting them independent in terms of mobility and not relying on crutches anymore. Yeah. And it's that second six weeks where I find that people can sometimes get a bit ahead of themselves. You almost have to rein them back a little bit and say, well, it, you know, we can think about doing these more intense things now, but remember we're still not that far into the future from when you've had this major incident. So we find that the first period of time you have that first two weeks, people are like, what have I done? It feels, <laughs> feels horrible. And then two weeks later, it's like, this is really good. I'm starting to get moving again. And then another four weeks after that, sometimes you're like, hang on, slow down a little bit because it still has to, to recover. And um, you know, the body's still got to accept this new joint uh, and you've got to get used to it. Well, this, kind of, this is what you guys do. So such experts in is, is rehabilitation, which I've explained to people is this, is the brain adapting to the new mechanical environment that the surgeon has created so they've been used to walking in a particular way before surgery maybe limping leaning into it stooping and if suddenly mm. they're released and the brain's receiving this information which is completely different to what it was preoperatively and the brain's computer has to reorientate itself to this new information that's coming through i'd love to get your thoughts on something jeremy so yeah. there's there's been a there's been a push. I don't know if this is just in my local area with the NHS, but we've come across four or five incidents now of a patient who's had a total hip replacement. Yep. And they've been told by whether it was their, uh, their, their hospital clinician or their surgeon that they don't need any post-op physio because this, the, the operation's so good and if they just follow this, you know, this sheet of paper, they just do their home exercises. They don't need to see a physio after surgery. I'd love to get your thoughts on whether that's a good idea. Is that just because the, the joints are getting so much better? Or do you think that's that's folly being played out here? People who have hip replacement surgery need an experienced physiotherapist to guide them through that phase of their recovery. People need encouragement. They need reassurance and they need benchmarking. They need to know they're making progress. They need objective evidence of that, which is this positive feedback loop, which allows them to move on at a pace which is appropriate for them, which is not going to scare them and is not going to make them despondent because they're not, they, they, they think they're not making enough progress. So I think it's really important to have an experienced seasoned physiotherapist who understands the whole process so that they get the most out of it quickly and safely. Because one of the things, of course, that people get scared of is the precautions that we impose on them to avoid dislocation and wound problems. And I think that yeah. is a lot on people's minds. And that's where a physiotherapist can be so important because they can say, yep, stick within the rules, but actually you are making excellent progress here and we can move you on to the next step. So it's, uh, to me, it's essential. Without physiotherapy, people just don't achieve their, their, their you know, they, they don't reach escape velocity. So... Jeremy, can you tell us about some common myths or maybe misconceptions with hip surgery that people might come to you with and you have to kind of bust those myths? Is there anything you see people coming to you with quite often? Yeah, I think the, the biggest myths, Will, are things like, I'm, am I too young for surgery? Or am I too old for surgery? Am I too unwell for it? So the young side of it, people get, you know, when I was a, a trainee, people would be told to put off surgery as long as they can because the hips that were put in would wear out and you didn't want to have this repeated cycle of redo surgery where the outcome is never as good and eventually becomes impossible. Mm. So people were put off having surgery. I think the materials we have now are far better and people do want, you know, understandably to get on with their lives again. I think it's an important part of 
of, of your life, if you if you can't mobilize and you're in pain all the time, if you're in your 30s or 40s or even younger, um, you can't live like that. And having a hip replacement or resurfacing will transform your life. And people, I think, are much more understanding of that now they want to be able to live their life to work raise a family do the things in life they enjoy and and the implants that we have now the techniques we have available to us have a much better chance of giving them that chance at life so i think that's been a big change you you are never too young for it yeah. so you have to understand what the restrictions might be and what the implications are but I think things have changed dramatically there. And again, too old for surgery. There's, you're never too old for it. As long as you're in reasonably good fit, state of health, we can operate on pretty much anybody. The oldest I've done is 100, youngest oh, I've wow. done is So yeah. you're never too young or too old to benefit from this type of surgery. But obviously it has to be a very carefully considered decision. Uh, and, and one mm. has to understand all the the implications of surgery, what it involves and what might be, what the future might hold for you. Yeah, I, th I think that's great. And my grandpa was uh, 90 years old when he had his hip replaced and it, it made a massive, massive difference. Um, and my my nan on the other side, she, um, she was in her 80s when her hip got really, really bad. And I know you can't die of arthritis, but I think she was about as close as you possibly can get to dying of the disease she was so disabled she was in so much pain and it was like her quality of, of life was just zero um to, so to find a surgeon who was willing to do it and um she even had you know an, an underlying heart problem that they knew about and they said look we can still work around this and obviously there's risks but it, it will probably still be worth it for you because your quality of life right now is just non-existent and yeah it, it played out brilliantly and it, it worked to treat so you know, it is a hugely disabling condition. And before joint replacement surgery came along, people were crippled with it, you know, spend the, their remaining years in a wheelchair. It, it can be absolutely debilitating for people. And um, I think when it gets to that point, I think you're absolutely right. It's why, why delay it now? We've got the technology there where, where these hips last a very, very, very long time. And, um, you know, when it gets to a certain point, it's like, Maybe you can improve it by 10%, but you're not going to get that quality of life back unless something drastic changes. So yeah, I think that's a really good bit of advice for people. And then you've got to balance the, the risks of, of treatment or the, the, the medications that you have. Anti-inflammatories and paracetamol, not good in, in the long term, causing kidney damage, gut damage, putting your blood pressure up, immobility. Yeah poor mobility, increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease, so blood pressure, stroke, heart attacks, type 2 diabetes. You've got to balance all these things against the risks of surgery, which are much more predictable now than they used to be, a better preoperative assessment, better multidisciplinary care. So you know, the, decision, the, the decisions people are making now are very different from what they were 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the the impact on the other physical areas of the body, if you have a severely arthritic hip, you're also going to lose your quad muscles and you're also going to lose your calf muscles because you can't exercise, you can't walk or, or do any kind of resistance training because that hip is in the way. So not only is your hip at risk, but now your knee is as well. And now, you know, your, your overall mobility is too and your, or your lower back. So yeah, I think there's just no need to delay if someone's ready for it then as you say i think that's it's such a good bit of advice to kind of get them in um and get them going what are your thoughts on supplements do you do you give supplements so i don't give supplements to my patients but i get asked about them all the time and my take on supplements is that they're very overrated as a whole i think that um people Unfortunately, fall victims quite often to the marketing of supplement companies, and it's easy to market, uh, you know, a pill that's going to fix this or that. And I think some supplements have promise, but we need to be realistic with what we're expecting from these supplements. And I think even if you find a supplement that works well for you, you're probably looking at a 5% improvement in whatever it is you're trying to improve. And that would be realistic. Now, the, um, the, the, the situations when that isn't the case, 
and when people have a bigger improvement tend to be when they've inadvertently fixed a deficiency that they have. So, for example, if someone is very deficient in vitamin D and then they take a vitamin D supplement and bring themselves back up to a, an acceptable level, they might see a massive improvement in their health. But if someone's already got good vitamin D levels and then they take a vitamin D supplement, they're not going to see such an extreme improvement. So if ever anyone asks me about supplements, the first thing I say is it might be worth getting some kind of a blood screen done to, to test where you are on some of these key vitamins and minerals. And if you are deficient, then correcting them makes makes a lot of sense. I'm not sure what your take is on supplements that show promise for, for arthritis. I've got my own thinking about various things. It'd be good to hear your your take on what the literature is saying at the moment. Well, I think, as you said, vitamin D is number one. You know, most people in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly who are doing sedentary work, are going to be relatively vitamin D deficient, particularly in the autumn and winter. So anybody coming to see me who uh, who is at risk of vitamin D deficiency, I, I will say to them, just, just order some vitamin D from Amazon or go to the supermarket and buy some vitamin D. Things like chondroitin and glucosamine are very popular. And there is some weak evidence that they will help in osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, but the hip, I think it's marginal. But again, I think there's, pro there's, there's, there's something promising in, in those supplements. But I agree with you, you know, at most you're going to get a 5%. Yeah. Creatine, I know a lot of the people who go to the gym use creatine to try and build up muscle mass. But if you if you can't exercise because your hips are painful, you're not going to build much muscle mass taking creatine. And there are risks with some of the yeah. protein powders, particularly if you've got underlying kidney disease or diabetic. So I think you have to be cautious with them and take medical advice. Other things... Definitely. The turmeric, I think, has some promise as an antioxidant or it has antioxidative properties which are helpful in inflammation. Again, no hard evidence for it. Ginger, again, similar to turmeric. So a lot of these things are have a sort of sound underlying basis of anti-inflammatory properties. But you know, if if it were a miracle fix, everybody would be taking them. There's some yeah. good advice on the Versus Arthritis website, what used to be the old Arthritis Research Council. There's a good section mm. on that, on um, on the use of supplements. It doesn't completely dismiss yeah. them, but it just you know casts a, a relatively well. It's an objective viewpoint on on the use of supplements. So yeah, I it's a really good resource. I like it. I, I point patients to it quite yeah. off, quite often, and. You know, they've, they've got a good balanced view of these things. It doesn't yeah. tell people just to not take anything. It, it weighs up the, the pros and cons and the evidence of those things. Um, I, th I think you raise a really interesting point about creatine. Yeah. And I mean, people ask me more and more nowadays about creatine. There's more evidence coming out for it. It's, it's been around in bodybuilding for ages, you know, since the 1980s or earlier. And I think it helps to understand what it does because it's one of the only supplements that has been shown to have an effect on muscle size and strength. But as you say, it's not just going to magically improve muscle size and strength if you're not giving your body the stimulus yeah. to, to, to grow muscle. And creatine works by replacing your phosphocreatine stores within your muscle. And those only get burnt down or broken down when we exercise with high intensity. So if someone's got you know, hip arthritis and they, they, they can't go to the gym, they can't lift weights, they can't stress their muscles to the point where they would improve. Taking creatine is not going to do anything and not going to improve it at all. So what's your, what's your uh, way to someone who has a painful arthritic hip, who wants to, you know, prehab themselves for surgery, who wants to build up some resilience and make the most of the muscle they've got? Well, first, I think it's a it's a fabulous goal to have. So anyone who comes to seek advice from us um, ab about how to get themselves into the best possible position before surgery, I think is doing a brilliant thing for themselves, both in the short term and the long term. And the answer to that really is we just start where the patient currently is. So we have people who are, I would say, very disabled coming in with uh, very little mobility, very little strength. And, you know, they're 12 weeks out from surgery and we have to be realistic with those people and say, look, you know, we're not, you're not going to be, you're not going to be at hundred percent by the time you go in, but we can get you an improvement and it is going to make a difference. And then equally we'll have people who come in who are, you know, might as well be masters athletes 
at that level and you know they're like i just want to do everything i can i'm already pretty good but you know i want to be at 100 percent afterwards so i think the first thing we would do is we assess the the range of motion around not just the hip but also the knee and the, the ankle and the spine and if there's some deficiencies there we will give that patient a a plan and some treatment to try and improve that yeah. but i think the biggest thing we do is work on strength that would be our main focus for for prehab and the glutes are unbelievably important for for the hip they support the hip and help you when you walk so we look at um, both the the abductors which are your your upper glutes your gluteus medius and minimus and um, and then your your extensors so primarily your, your gluteus maximus which is the big one that everyone thinks of in the in the buttock and if we can get those firing that makes a big difference then going further down the hip we we also look at the the stabilizing muscles so the ones that control the alignment of the femur when people walk so obviously the abductors fall into that category as well but we also look at the the adductors the muscles on the inside of the groin we look at the hip flexors and then moving further down the quads are incredibly important for for anyone who wants to regain their uh, strength and mobility after surgery one of your quads is also a, a hip muscle the rectus femoris so we look at making sure that's nice and strong and then we look at movement as a whole so we look at whether that person can squat whether they can climb stairs and and their technique for doing those things and that can reveal quite a few deficiencies and give us more goals for, for strengthening ahead of surgery. And another area we, we like to focus on is, uh, is actually down in the calves. So long way away from the hip, but there's some really interesting research to show that uh, a 20% decrease in your calf strength leads to at least a 40% higher emphasis required from your hips wow. to give you the same walking speed. So people who are weak in their calves their hips have to do disproportionately more work to compensate. And this has actually been shown to make people walk slower and to um, make them more fatigued when walking. So people who had weak calves suffered twice as much fatigue from the same walking distance and speed as age-matched controls who had strong calves. And they put that down to the fact that these people were suddenly having to rely twice as hard on their glutes, which are bigger muscles. And those muscles are not uh, sort of powerful. They're not sort of the, the muscles you want to be doing your endurance work, if that makes sense. So they put that down to, you know, a, a mismatch between um, the muscles that are doing the work and the ones that should be doing the work, if that makes sense. So calf strength is really important, makes a big difference to independence in the patients we see. That's amazing. I had I wasn't aware of that, but it makes a huge amount of sense. And of course, one of the things about not walking so quickly is that uh, people who walk briskly tend to have a lower metabolic age, and their yes. risk for cardiovascular disease is reduced. So the slower you walk, uh, the more, of course, those risks go up. Um, so there is, yeah. a, you know, all this huge interaction between you know fitness muscle mass uh, and cardiovascular problems uh, which yeah. have to be addressed don't they because the other thing that i know with people who are, are coming in for hip surgeries who want to get fit and they they struggle to get their quads up understandably mm. also but they but then mm. their upper body as well and one of the things i try and encourage them to do is to work on their upper body as well because they're going to be using crutches for a while post-operatively so the more yeah. they do in their upper body that will help them too in their rehab yeah it's a really really good point and we always used to say this when i worked in professional football it's like if a player has a knee injury it's like oh, i don't want to go into the gym today and it's like well is your other knee injured is your <laughs> upper body injured no we can still work these other things mm -hmm. um and i think you're absolutely right it's a great point with the crutches that can sometimes be a shock to the body um, we often end up dealing with secondary problems from crutches like shoulder pain in our patients and if that can be prevented with some strengthening beforehand then it's it's so well worth it because you don't want to end up with a rotator cuff problem because you're so reliant on your crutches for the first you know four to six weeks uh, and then have two things to worry about so yeah upper body is important and just strengthening any area of the body seems to have a global effect as well it helps people with their with their mobility generally and there's some some very interesting data that i can't quite figure out where 
if you were to just work your your upper body for a time even if you did no work to your lower body you would still see some strength improvements in your lower body as well mm. so it's like the the entire muscular system is it's exactly that it's a system it's not just one muscle in isolation that you work at a time it it all seems to play into each other yeah it's all synergistic isn't it and that then that comes back really? to what we talk about with supplements as well and this whole issue of inflammation which is a big big topic at the moment and of course you know osteoarthritis has an inflammatory component yeah and and we take anti-inflammatories to try and reduce the amount of pain that's caused by inflammation and that brings me back to another big issue in being an orthopedic surgeon looking at hips is is middle-aged women of course the menopause is a huge factor in the development yes. of arthritic problems in middle age uh, because estrogen as estrogen falls during the menopause estrogen is a very important anti-inflammatory hormone uh, it's, mm. it's bone mass muscle mass and these women can fall off a cliff in terms of their metabolism they put on weight their ability to you know their, their glucose uh, metabolism goes up the creek um, they start to lose bone mass muscle mass and to have all sorts of problems related to the menopause and it has this di almost seeming a direct effect on the development of arthritic conditions particularly in some of these women who've got mild dysplasia of the hips that suddenly just gets mm. worse in their late 40s and 50s I, I'm, you must see this as well yeah we see this all the time and in the chapter I'm writing at the moment for my for my newest book, I found some research that suggests that up to menopausal age, when you compare men and women, men have a higher rate of arthritis generally. And then as soon as you get to that menopausal age, it switches. So women have a higher rate of arthritis pretty much everywhere in the body. And I think that's exactly as a result of what you're saying, that that drop in estrogen can be catastrophic sometimes for women. And... One of the things we see is, uh, and one of the things that women tell us about, is the um, the loss of muscle mass that can occur quite quickly afterwards. Mm. And what people don't always understand is that you've got your your anabolic hormones in your body. You've obviously got testosterone, which people know about, and women do have some testosterone. But estrogen is also anabolic. It, it supports the growth and maintenance of muscle mass. And to suddenly lose that, it's like, suddenly women are fighting an uphill battle trying to keep muscle on their body. So I think at that age, getting a resistance training practice and working on maintaining your muscles is absolutely vital. And um, one of the other things we see is that when estrogen goes away, then you have uh, a drop in the quality of the, the collagen production in your body as well. And resistance training can help to support that and improve it. So it might feel like everything's working against you if you are a woman in, in that age but resistance training can help to slow down and combat some of these effects that might be naturally occurring in the body yeah yeah it's it's, it's a fascinating field and of course it's it's yeah, absolutely burgeoning everyone's sort of piling into this at the moment um because yeah. it is such a big problem particularly you know the middle-aged age cohort which is so big at the moment there's a lot of interest in you know journalists are very interested in this it's a yeah. big public health issue uh, and i think there's some you know big problems uh, women getting appropriate advice about uh, the menopause hrt and there's a lot of people now specializing it so I, I will often refer some of my patients who are having these arthritic problems in during the menopause uh, will refer them to an hrt specialist for an assessment because there is a lot yeah. more that can be done with hrt now and i think uh, it's become a sort of speciality on its own this management of the perimenopause which has a huge effect on the, the sort of people we see and the treat the conditions that we see in these people yeah definitely and i think hrt was uh wrongly villainized for a long time there was a study that came out that was maybe misinterpreted uh, uh, and there was that all that scare about the breast cancer risk, but I think now the on on review, it seems that the risk was was overblown much of the time, and um, it can be quite simply life changing for many of the women that that I see. They yeah. put on HRT, and suddenly things just all seem to improve all at the same time. It can be brilliant. So, like you, I I have uh, clinicians that I'll refer 
patients too if they're suffering with a, a range of these symptoms and they're you know in that kind of risk group then um i mean getting advice is is absolutely vital um because you could be suffering unnecessarily if you don't yeah I, I'm, another person i refer to from time to time is a nutritionist there's a very interesting nutritionist around here who specializes in inflammatory conditions and looking at anti-inflammatory type diets um is another important part of this this whole spectrum of disorder that we see uh trying to manage inflammatory symptoms by addressing specific nutritional risks like you know ultra processed foods um carbohydrates reducing the, the carbs you eat keeping your weight under control eating a mediterranean type diet i mean all these mm. things uh, have incremental gains none of them is going to be a miracle but they are part of a a management strategy i think for for dealing with these problems that we see yeah i'm not sure if i'm right on this but i also think that there's some data to show that the mediterranean regions tend to have less incidence of arthritis than we do um and possibly that comes down to 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 the diet and what's in their food compared to us we're more likely to have high ultra processed food diets and i'm sure that's not healthy helping with the um the incidence of arthritis we see over here. Yeah, I agree. It must be a factor. I mean, the other, other confounding factors there, well, of course, things like you know exposure to sunlight. It comes yeah. back to vitamin D again. I think vitamin D is is the absolute link to all of these things, really. If someone's got osteoporosis, how might that change your approach to how you would treat a patient? Well, first of all, get the diagnosis. So if someone's at, a, at risk of osteoporosis, may they be on steroids, uh, not eating properly, um, malabsorption type problems, it's very important to get a baseline DEXA scan. That's the gold standard for diagnosing yeah. osteoporosis. If they have osteoporosis or are you know, strongly osteopenic, uh, I'll refer them to an expert in the management of that. Many GPs will do that as well. So there are you know, nice guidelines for the management of osteopenia, stroke osteoporosis with anti-resorptive drugs, you know, alandronic acid, calcium, vitamin D being key elements of that as well. And then um, in terms of the surgery, um, if someone's very osteoporotic, you have to be very careful not to break their bones when you're getting into the hip joint. Yeah. Uh, you might use different materials um, depending on how osteoporotic they are um often will use bone cement rather than uncemented stem because you don't want to break the femur by impacting the implant into place so yeah. there, a, there are issues about implant selection in people who are osteoporotic osteopenic but it doesn't have a big effect on what you do but obviously it's something you need to take into account uh yeah. But the main thing is, is to get them mobile again so that they can mobilize and start doing some weight bearing exercise to help reverse or, or minimize the impact of the osteoporosis. Yeah, so, so important. We see a lot of patients here with osteoporosis. And that was actually one of the big concerns for, for my nan before she went in for her hip replacement. She was very severely osteoporotic and it was one of the um, the considerations they had to make. You know, is it is this going to be safe? Is this going to is the hip going to accept it? You know, are we yeah. going to do more harm than good? Well, actually, um, one of the things about doing a hip replacement is you are removing one of the yeah. major structures that is affected by osteoporosis, which is the neck of the femur, which yeah. of course is of great risk of fracturing uh, if you have a fall and you have osteoporosis. So, by having a hip replacement, you are removing one of those sort of vulnerable structures but osteoporosis of course has a big effect on particularly the spine people who mm. have osteoporosis they start to get vertebral fractures and that can be crippling you know just yeah. pain management but also this gradual deformity of kyphosis difficulty breathing yes. postural changes balance issues so it's a massive problem it can be really nasty and i think prevention is is key for this and as you say, weight-bearing exercise is very, very important. There's some good evidence to show that regular walking can help to mitigate Certainly. bone mineral density loss. I, all, I also think osteoporosis is a little bit of a cruel condition in a way because the most important thing or the, the thing that has the highest evidence for increasing bone density, not just maintaining it, is resistance training. But once you get past a certain point, 
of osteoporosis, picking up heavy weights, you have to be incredibly careful with. Yeah. So I think that the, the early the early prevention is key. That's where the opportunity is. And it's it's starting, you know, as soon as you can. Middle age really is is where people should start. And um the the years that have the highest rate of bone mineral density loss in women are those immediately postmenopausal years. It then levels off a bit and then it, it only reaches those levels of loss when you get back to your 80s again on average. So you know, that's the time we should be starting, particularly yeah. in women. Yeah. And as we know, women are much more likely to suffer from osteoporosis than men. Um, so I think getting that message out there is is also vital. Yeah, I think for men, the frailty thing kicks in in their mid-70s. So mm -hmm. that's when it seems to be that it starts to accelerate, I think, in men. So the more you, you know, the more credit in the bank, so to speak, you can accrue during middle age the longer that period of, um, of avoiding frailty can be. So you know, I really like that as an analogy, you know, money in the bank. It's like you're, you're banking it for later on in life when you're going to need it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Going yeah. for sure. For sure. Well, that's been absolutely fascinating sharing your experience and thoughts um, and how they overlap with my experience as a hip surgeon. Really fascinating. I mean, really yeah, thank you so much. It's been brilliant. Yeah. I've learned a lot actually today. <laughs> Well, we should do it again sometime. But I'm really looking forward to looking at your your book. Do let me know when it's uh, published, and I'll we'll, we'll we can have a discussion about that because it's a it's it's as I say it's a huge public health issue. All these principles need to be promoted, uh, and and people need to know more about it. Yeah, it's quite a lot in the book about just exactly what we've been discussing today, and you know what to look for that might suggest you're a good candidate for for hip surgery, and also how to you know hopefully prevent some people from ever getting there and what to do after you've had the, the surgery, if you want to build strength and mobility again. So yeah, I'd be delighted to have another conversation about the book. It comes out um, next week. So 1st of October. Fantastic. And um, hoping it will make a lot of people happy and healthy. Great, great stuff. Well, good to talk to you and we'll speak again soon. Thanks very yeah, much. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Appreciate it. And I'll speak to you soon. Isn't he amazing? Will is just the sort of person that I'd like to go to for physio if I ever had to have a hip replacement. But for all of us in middle age, even if you don't have a dodgy hip, it's so important to stay strong, fit and healthy. And Will's new book would inspire many of us to do just that. I'll put a link to it below. Remember, it's never too late to start. If you'd like to know anything about hips and hip surgery, then please get in touch or leave a comment or question below. Thanks for watching. See you next time.